Hey there, folks. How's it going? You know, in this day and age, it pretty much goes without saying that we simply can't trust the news media anymore at all. So what's a person to do when they want the straight skinny on a hot story? Why, jump onto YouTube and find somebody with an opinion and a microphone, of course. So join me, your dime store Jesus cosplayer, as we look at some of the week's headlines and see if we can parse out exactly what's going on. And so, hey folks, welcome back. This is going to be the first of what I hope to be sort of a series where I just try and sort of dig into and dissect some of the news stories I see people screeching about on Twitter. Now, one of the first of these stories, something which caught my attention earlier in the week, is that of Brett Kavanaugh. Now, this is, of course, Donald Trump's pick to be the next Supreme Court justice to fill the soon-to-be vacant seat on the court. Now, a lot of people have been up in arms in both directions, some cheering, some booing with the MAGA set, screaming MAGA, 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 happy that Donald Trump will have a Supreme Court justice put in place, and many on the left screeching about it being the end of women's health care altogether and the end of the environment as we know it. Now, when we look at some of his record, we start to get a rather interesting picture, which uh, does kind of give one reason to pause and ask why anyone is excited to see this man happen. Now, this comes to me from Politico. This is uh, breaking down Brett Kavanaugh's record. Now, one of the central pieces that people have been getting mostly upset about is his stances on abortion and reproductive rights. Now, when it comes to this, Kavanaugh argued in 2015 that... Obamacare's mandate for contraception coverage infringed on the rights of religious organizations. Many of you probably remember this fight that was going on, a stance that some religious liberty groups have hailed. Now, this isn't the, the, the end of his support for sort of the religious right in this sense. But he also descended from a decision last fall that permitted an undocumented immigrant teen to have an abortion, although some conservatives have accused him of being too cautious in that case. Now, when it comes to this, it really can't be all that surprising when you have one of these typically more conservative, Republican style, or I dare say neoconservative style, uh, jurists uh, on the bench writing opinions, you're going to find this sort of dissent which supports the pro-life stance and the religious right whenever it can, opposing any form of uh, support or legalization of abortion, any things like this. So this really can't be that much of a surprise. But his, uh, his, his ties with the religious right are rather interesting. They don't stop there. That even goes into religion in schools. Here they write, Kavanaugh has suggested he may be open to widening the flow of public funding to religious schools. In an essay last year for the American Enterprise Institute, he cheered the late Chief Justice William Rehnquist's efforts to reverse prior Supreme Court attempts at, quote, erecting a strict wall of separation between church and state. This is, once again, a judge who clearly doesn't really seem to respect the Establishment Clause much at all. Now, he says this happens especially when it comes to schools, and he also predicted during a CNN appearance in 2000 that the court would one day uphold school vouchers. Now, within this, we do see that he is definitely a friend of the religious right, which for a number of groups should raise some concern. But beyond this, one of the real central issues, which I'm surprised more people aren't taking more aggressive stances on, or at least worrying more openly about, comes when it comes to the issue of privacy. Now, it isn't strictly because he's taken a hardline neoconservative approach saying that your privacy doesn't matter, as much as it is that his record is something of a kind of mixed bag, really. Now, when it comes to digital privacy, he joined other judges in rejecting a challenge to the National Security Agency's warrantless collection of phone metadata. You guys will probably remember this story as well as it was the program that was sort of exposed by Edward Snowden. Now, in his... Uh, in his uh, opinion, he wrote that the operation exposed by Snowden, quote, is entirely consistent with the Fourth Amendment. Curiously enough, though, furthermore, he wrote a critical national security need outweighs the impact on privacy occasioned by this program. In this, he's almost trying, it almost seems as though he's trying to say that this program is constitutional, but at the same time, even if it wasn't, it doesn't matter. Now, we get to the real mixed bag in this uh, overall privacy issue when it comes to a case debating whether authorities needed a warrant to tag a suspect's car with a GPS tracker to track their movements. 
On one hand, he and other Republican judges said that a suspect has no reasonable expectation of privacy in his public movements. But at the same time, Kavanaugh separately said that the government might have violated his property rights, this being the suspect's property rights, by tampering with a vehicle, an argument that uh, Justice Scalia actually later cited in a ruling which mandated that authorities did in fact require warrants to track people's cars in this manner. Now, when it comes to issues such as immigration, we're not really, can't really be all that surprised. Uh, his um, supporters of immigration restriction praised Kavanaugh for two s specific cases, one where he opposed granting special visas for Brazilian workers when Americans could do the same job, and another in which he argued that an, a union election was void because undocumented immigrants had voted in it and tainted the results. So right there, we do see that he does have the sort of uh, hardish, conservative style position on immigration, something that I'm sure lots of those on the right will be happy to see brought to power in the Supreme Court. Likewise, his stances on things such as workers' rights are a little dodgy, at least from a unionist perspective. Um, writing an opinion in 2016 saying employers can require workers to waive their right to picket and arbitration agreements. And of course, for the environmental crowd, he is, well, not exactly their favorite. He's ruled many times against the EPA, trying to restrict their authorities, trying to take a very pro-business, business-friendly approach to it. Now, when we take all of this together and consider what it is that this particular judge, this jurist here, seems to bring to his overall judicial perspectives, we get something that is very much easily called a neoconservative, I would say. Now, this is funny because he was also being looked at by George W. Bush back when it was his turn to fill Supreme Court vacancies. Now, I'm not sure whether or not he was looking at him uh, for the position that went to either Roberts or, or um, Alito there. But naturally, when we've got somebody who's being looked at by George W. Bush and he's the pick of the litter for Donald Trump, well, I think neocon is a pretty safe, uh, pretty safe term to use in this case. All in all, though, he is uh, not a friend of federal regulations regulations, not a friend of the APA, not a friend of environment, not a friend of workers, not a friend of immigrants, but he does have some rather interesting ideas about privacy, so long as it's connected to property. And so now, staying with the sort of politically themed stories, we get one that came to us and uh, really just lit our screens up all Thursday. This, of course, was the uh, hearing at which embattled agent Peter Strzok, got that from Twitter, by the way, that Z is silent, apparently. Um, on Thursday, defended a controversial text he sent disparaging Donald Trump during the 2016 campaign, um, saying it was a response to Trump attacking a, the immigrant Gold Star family, who he'd insulted at the time. Now, the text exchange and issue was detailed in the recently released Justice Department internal watchdog report, revealing that on August 8, 2016, now ex-FBI lawyer Lisa Page wrote in a text, Trump is, quote, not ever going to become president, right? Right? To which Stroke replied, no, no, he's not. We'll stop it. Now, in the grilling, which happened, which itself became really the show, even bigger than the issue under debate and under investigation in the first place, uh, we got a lot of uh, heated, spicy exchanges going on between the chairman as well as Representative Louis Gomer, who you might remember from the Obama's State of the Union, in which he shouted out, you lie. The reforms, the reforms I'm proposing would not apply to those who are here illegally. Not true. Well, here Gomer sort of doubled down on that particular flavor by um, by asking uh, Stroke straight up if he lied to his wife as many times as he was lying on the job. And I can't help but wonder when I see you looking there with a little smirk, how many times did you look so innocent into your wife's eye and lie to her about uh, Lisa? Mr. Chairman, this is outrageous. Now, throughout this, this is all stemming ultimately from the Russia probe, the Mueller Russia probe, and the questions surrounding how oh, correctly the FBI handled what they were dealing with then. But the spectacle itself, well, we're just going to play a little clip here, and the sheer amount of memes which are going to come out of this are, are just mm, absolutely delicious.
Now, if anything, now we can go over this issue for days and days, and I'm actually not even going to spend too much time talking about the, the questions about Russia colluding with the uh, Trump campaign or anything like this. On that, I will say, on the one hand, I do find it kind of funny that a lot of people out there who at one time believed that there was a secret child sex dungeon in the basement of a pizza place uh, find it difficult to believe that a foreign superpower would attempt to influence our elections. I mean, it's kind of something we do all the time, and it's something really any power does whenever they can. But now, when it comes to the question of collusion itself, I, like most rational, empirical people, need some really hard evidence before I can altogether buy that. Now, whether or not Russia was actually trying to influence the election, no doubt in my mind. I mean, why wouldn't they? They're one of the biggest competitors on the planet. But beyond even all of that, I think that this hearing here, especially uh, the faces made, the voices raised, the kinds of questions that were bandied and bantered back and forth, and everybody getting all kinds of offended at each other for what ultimately seemed to boil down to the repeating of a series of questions, and uh, what almost in many cases kind of felt like an attempt to get a gotcha moment out of this thing. Well, in the course of this, I think we got a really good sort of example about where we stand politically these days. You go onto Twitter and you see the kind of blowout, knockout, drag down sorts of fights that people start having over oftentimes silly or irrelevant issues. And then you apply that in a place like Congress, you're starting to kind of see that the political divisions that we've got are not just deep. The divisions themselves are not just insanely deep. They're also, what's a good word, um, fucking retarded. We've lost all sense of decorum and, I dare say, civility in this day and age with uh, the very concepts of decorum and civility seeming to become now partisan and ideological footballs where it's bandied back and forth and it itself becomes an issue. We are living in an age right now in which nothing that comes out of our political processes is in any real way respectable, let alone something everyone can get behind. The unity and the e pluribus unum that we once sort of held so close to the chest seems to be a thing of the distant past. But oh boy, what a shit show and who doesn't love a shit show? Especially with this, uh, well, sort of Batman-y Bond villain facial uh, expressions that kept coming out of him. Oh, it's going to be fun to see how this story pans out going forward. And now transitioning to something a little less political, a little less heavy, we've got the story of Papa, 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 Papa John's, that's right. The purveyor of some of the country's shittiest pizza has now had its founder and former CEO completely step down and leave the company after, uh, well, accusations, or at least actually after recording surfaced and uh, reports surfaced that uh, he used, well, he was dropping N-bombs apparently in a conference call uh, discussing the company's public image of all things. Now, this comes after a slightly protracted debate about Papa John's decision to sort of, uh, well, take a take a take an unpopular stance, let's say, on the kneeling protests at the NFL, claiming that these protests were hurting sales. Now, in this, we get a perfect example of the with us or against us mentality that seems to have infected every single political movement out there to the point where when a shitty pizza chain just says that a given protest is hurting sales and they don't support it for that reason, well, suddenly that's a reason reason to start believing that they're supporting white supremacy or something of this nature. Now, the strange thing to this story, when you hear about a CEO, when you hear about a high-profile individual dropping an N-bomb like that, usually you think it's going to out them as an open racist, maybe, uh, you know, having a, a heated gaming moment, if you will. But in the same context, once we look into the context of what was said and why, it gets even kind of sillier. Apparently, this came up in a conference call discussing the company's public image and race relations issues, in which he even went as far as saying, Colonel, Sanders commonly called blacks that word and then even going on to say that in his, uh, that in his youth growing up in Indiana uh, black people used to be dragged by trucks to their death now all of this seems to be a kind of I dare say just really terrible shitty attempt at painting himself as not a racist but all the same the word came out of his mouth and all of a sudden all hell broke loose. Now, as of Thursday, he was officially resigned from the company, though he does still own 30% of it uh, of its stock, which is, uh, I believe, somewhere in the tune of about a half a billion dollars or so. So, yeah, Papa John's not going to be doing too bad. And strangely enough, too, as reported by Philly D yesterday, the stock price, despite taking a bit of a dip when the story broke and when he left initially, it's actually up now. The stock price went up. So, in terms of how uh, public relations scandals that erupt from what seem to be public relations conference calls can affect the company's bottom line, I think it's a very interesting lesson in economics and business. 
lesson is to be learned here. But once again, I'm forced to come back to the question of how it is that everyone can be so upset with Papa John for reportedly saying this awful word in a conference call and ultimately ending his career as it was, when this entire time, his greatest, greatest crime has been selling this terrible fucking pizza, like inedible cardboard with Parmesan cheese on it. It's, it's fucking atrocious. And for the last story today, again, straying a little bit away from the politics, at least the sort of conventional politics, but still saying with the, uh, you know, the socially, uh, the, the social pearl clutchers of the world. We have Henry Cavill, that's right, our new Superman. He and his mustache, apparently, in an interview, said that he's a, a little nervous when it comes to dating, a little nervous when it comes to approaching women, talking with them, because he doesn't want to get me too Now, it's understandable, really, when you think about it. Somebody of a high profile, such as his, is, is a ripe and prime target for this Me Too movement, which seems to be sort of just trying to, well, it's basically like sniping with a shotgun in a sense. They're trying to take out anyone they can, and, and in, in many cases, it's, it's been uh, it's not a bad thing. After all, we've now got Harvey Weinstein um, <laughs> you know, officially with his feet to the fire over the nasty and, uh, frankly, uh, unconscionable shit that he was pulling, as well as a number of other big Hollywood names who've been found to be really abusing their power, which, oh my God, can you believe? It. But all the same, Cavill's comments came while he was sort of discussing his dating life, saying that between his profile and the sort of climate and atmosphere in which we live now, between the battle of the sexes going into practically a thermonuclear war as it has, that he doesn't really feel comfortable approaching women in that way. That he won't sort of try to push past the initial no, which is something that oftentimes women will even tell men to do when they're trying to meet and ask other women out, simply because sometimes, you know, is that hard to get thing? Well, Cavill's not having any of it, but the story didn't end there, because guess what happens as soon as a major Hollywood star says something about the Me Too movement that it, is, it isn't universally and wholly supporting it as the most important thing ever. That's right. He's being insensitive to the victims of rape. My God. In these sorts of things, I am sort of forced to almost adopt an MRA position that the, uh, the hysterics of modern feminism really do seem to have created the environment in which it's just simply not safe to talk to women. Uh, it almost might be more of a MGTOW position at this point, really. But as usual, it seems that the shrewd crusaders, or uh, I'm sorry, not shrewd, shrill, shrill crusaders out there trying to turn everything they can into an issue of rape culture, uh, they, they, they really can't see the writing on the wall when it comes to how it is being interpreted by people on the other side. Now, I'm going to leave with this, and it connects to this Cavill story pretty well. In our ongoing disputes, in our uh, flaming war, in our flame wars and all of our shit show arguments that we seem to be having, it seems to be exceptionally easy in this day and age for people to ultimately forget that the people who have different or dissenting opinions from their own are not, in fact, the fucking devil. Sometimes people have just a difference of opinion or a different perspective. Now, in this Cavill case, we get a perfect example of it because nowhere in there was he saying that the Me Too movement is itself a bad thing. He's not saying that he believes that... Um, you know, that sexual assault is okay, or that women are property, or that he doesn't respect women, or any of that. He was simply saying that his interpretation of the modern sexual atmosphere that we, we're facing now, in terms of people of profile being ripe and easy targets, oftentimes for salacious and sometimes flatly untrue statements and claims, has created an environment where he feels personally uncomfortable doing a thing that, he's other, that he would otherwise do. When this is taken in context by the crusaders out there who are sure that every Every woman is a victim and waiting and that every man is a rapist waiting to happen. Well, you kind of get this impression that people just aren't really interested in listening to each other anymore. If you don't agree with me, you're the goddamn enemy. You're Hitler. You're Stalin. You're Mao. You're, uh, well, you get what I'm saying. So all the same, with this, if I'm going to leave you with anything for this first of what I plan to be a series of news videos and my hot takes to come at the end of them, I would say... In the course of this, maybe we should tune back some of the rhetoric. Maybe it would be healthy for us as a society to sort of slow down just a little bit. And just even before we fly off the handle, which so many of us inevitably will when we hear something we don't like, to maybe consider that those with the opinions that we don't respect, that we don't agree with, that we don't like, aren't necessarily holding them for some nefarious or evil purpose, but simply because they have a different perspective, which right or wrong doesn't jive with what we think. It doesn't make them the devil. It doesn't make them Hitler. It doesn't make them Stalin. It just makes them different. 
And it's going to be a whole lot easier, especially if their points are wrong or full of shit, to demonstrate and argue and explain how those points are full of shit if we take the time to really understand them before leaping to conclusions about what they mean. So that's been the news for this Friday, uh, 13th. Oh, shit, I really picked a hell of a day to begin this. Hope you enjoyed it. If you uh, like this kind of content and you'd like to see more, leave a like down below. Leave a dislike if you didn't, but either which way, explain why down in the comments. As always, a warm thank you and a welcome to all my uh, returning subscribers and especially my patrons. You guys keep the lights on. You guys keep this channel rolling. You guys keep me fed and alive, and I thank you for it. If you're interested in supporting the channel, there are links down below to plenty of different ways you can do that. PayPal, Patreon, and all of that. And don't forget to catch me on YouTube Saints every Sunday night at uh, 1030 Eastern Standard Time over on the channel. Also linked down below. And there's another streaming site that we sometimes work on on Thursdays for midweek, but I'm not going to say what that is because I don't don't want to get a strike. So until then, I've been Nicholas Garoff, the Wizard of Cause, your YouTube newsman. I'm really going to have to work on that. Go the fuck away. And I'll see you in the next video.